we have David Liu. David Liu is a 30-year veteran of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. He started his investment banking career working for Goldman Sachs and then joined Jefferies. He has completed over $15 billion of transactions with hundreds of companies, including household names like IBM, Google, Microsoft, Sony, Yahoo, and Yelp. He recently wrote a humorous career book called The Way of, of uh, Wall Street. It's right here. This is the uh, Wall, uh, the Way of the Wall Street Warrior. It's available on Amazon. I personally got the, the Audible book. Uh, it is available in Kindle and in, in hardcover formats that you can uh, get. Uh, and um, so uh, just a few more things. It is an award-winning bestseller, and he wrote the book to help un underrepresented communities achieve their career goals. Dave has pledged 100% of his net proceeds from the book to charity. So that's that's phenomenal, Dave. Uh, he's also chairman of the Philanthropic uh, Advisory Council of Smile Train, the largest cleft-focused organization. Finally, he's uh, also a, a vice chairman of ASAM News, one of the top news sites for Asian for an Asian America. Dave, welcome to the show. Sabir, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's funny that before we would even get started with this live interview, you and I jammed for the past thirty minutes talking about everything Asia. You know, everything related to Asia. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Before I get started diving deep into the topic, which is Asian American uh, entrepreneurship, uh, I'd like to uh, get to know you a little bit better. I want I would like the audience to get to know you better. Uh, what was your childhood and upbringing like? I mean, fifteen billion dollars and and an amazing resume and career. That's that's amazing. But I, I love uh, hearing the the backstory. Yeah, so my background, my backstory is probably the type that when you when you first hear it, and I'll tell you it, uh, you definitely wouldn't have thought that I would have ended up where I am today. Um, and I, I I take pride in that, honestly. That uh, you know, what my my uh, foundation, if you will, you know, where I first uh, showed some green shoots, um, was not essentially uh, where I ended up. And I think it is a testament to the. Uh, power of, you know, good luck and fortune and what happens when you work hard and some people look out for you. Um, so I was born in the U.S., but I actually grew up in Asia, I moved to Hong Kong uh, when I was two years old. Uh, so even though I'm Asian American, um, I really grew up in an environment where I was the majority. I was not the minority. So I didn't have a, a lot of that exposure that I think a lot of Asian Americans who grew up in America feel where, you know, pot potentially feel like a second class citizen, potentially feel like the system is rigged against them. That wasn't my childhood. My childhood was one where I was a majority. Uh, I was uh, the same ethnicity as the people in power. Um, and it was a it was a pretty good uh, environment to be in, particularly if you're a capitalist, particularly if ultimately you want to be an entrepreneur, because there wasn't any environment uh, that was as dynamic and as exciting as Hong Kong in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, if you are a student of history, you'll know that uh, during that period, at the beginning of that period, uh, Hong Kong was just like some backwater um, entry pot and nothing like the financial powerhouse that it is today. Um, but as I was growing up, you would routinely see huge skyscrapers uh, be built uh, in a record time. And you would see the growth of multinational corporations. And my father was an entrepreneur. So I saw, saw firsthand what it was like at a very young age to build a business and grow a business. Uh, now, that's the positive side of uh, my upbringing. The negative was that uh, I was actually born with uh, some pretty intense uh, birth challenges. So I was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. And in layman's terms, what that means is I was born with this massive hole in the center of my face. Wow. And I uh, had uh, 11 craniofacial surgeries, uh, which are not like going to get your finger fixed. Uh, they're anything to do with your skull is pretty intense. So I had 11 of those. I spent... Uh, pretty much up until uh, the age of 15, 16, uh, I spent my life in treatment and in the hospital. Um, and uh, the, the really challenging part is that uh, we all know that growing up, particularly in your teenage years, is tough because other kids can be uh, pretty mean. 
Um, mm -hmm. And for someone that has a, a facial difference, uh, it can be even more challenging. Um, uh, I think the only thing that could be worse is if I was born in this era with social media. But as I was growing up, I would be ostracized, you know, I would be called names like monster and elephant boy. Um, and that definitely had a huge impact on kind of my uh, impression of other people, but also it helped me think about, you know, my role and what ultimately I wanted to achieve in life. Um, and so I give you that backdrop because um, it, it kind of formulated who I am today. Um, and I will say the the epilogue is uh, hopefully a, a happy ending because um, despite all those challenges, uh, I, I feel that what I was born with is really not a curse but a blessing. And I would I'll, I'll tell you one key thing that I think really helped me was that growing up taught me to be really tough, taught me to be very self reliant, taught me to develop what I joke is called rhino skin. Uh, mm -hmm. In that means I can put up with a lot of crap <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and move on. And I will tell you, if there is one superpower that you need in uh, corporate America, in entrepreneurship, in whatever you want to achieve in life, because very rarely are these things handed to you, I think that one key superpower that I, that I would want everyone to have is thick skin. So I think a big part of the reason why I've been able to achieve a lot of what I wanted to achieve in my life was largely driven by the fact that when I was growing up, I developed this exterior and this uh, can-do attitude because nobody else was going to look out for me as, as I was growing up. I, I think it's, um, I actually call it deep scars on my back, you know, when you, when you run businesses, you know. The other thing is, I think when, when you are coming up uh, like that, you actually work overtime to overcome it so that you end up actually doing more than somebody who does not have that, that issue, right? That kind of a condition or anything like that. They do less, right? So that's how you can, you can get way ahead of them. So while they're complaining and doing, uh, you know, complaining about their life, which doesn't tend that, that tends to be not a big deal, right? Cause uh, you know, you know, lo losing a parent, for example, losing your home, your war, your country is on war, things like that, or you have a you know chronic disease or something like that. Those are serious problems, you know. You considering you don't you don't like uh, strawberry pancakes or you want chocolate pancakes. That's not devastating. That's not drama, <laughs> even though that's our reality TV nowadays. You know, uh, absolutely. And, and I think one thing just to accentuate what you just said, which. Uh... I think actually is uh, is one of the core tenets of what I, I've done in my life and also uh, I preach to people that I've mentored and helped is I, I really believe in the power of acute focus. I believe in the power of uh, focusing all your energies on a relatively short list of things that you need to accomplish. And that could be getting funding for your company. It could be hiring that rock star a CTO. It could be just getting that first customer. And one of the things that I think uh, having a challenge, whatever your challenge is in your life, you know, poverty, uh, facial difference, uh, birth defects, et cetera. I think what that does is it really helps you put things into perspective. Uh, you realize that strawberry on my pancakes is really, really low on that list, right? <laughs> but, but should not be on a list. <laughs> for some people, it's still on their list, right? But <laughs> For me, it was like, no, I don't care about strawberries. I just need a pancake, right? And I need to figure out what do I need to do to make sure that I have pancakes for myself and my family uh, in the long run? Because if I don't figure out a way to overcome the uh, bullying, the uh, mental health challenges that this uh, birth difference is giving me, then I'm going to end up in some office dungeon doing some job that nobody else wants, living an unfulfilled life. So I think that when you have uh, challenges around whatever your life circumstances are, I think that really helps you prioritize and develop that acute focus that I think is really necessary for success. You know, I would not be surprised because the thing is karma always comes back, right? I would not be surprised if Many of those people actually work for one of your companies. <laughs> they work for you. The, the same kid that they bullied back then. Now they 
earn their living through you. Yeah, or or uh, maybe they did work for me at one point, and then I realized, hey, this person doesn't work very hard, and I got rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe they were bullying their coworkers in, in future future tense, you know. Um, I, I mean, I didn't read one part of your bio, which has to do with your academic experience, right? I mean, you you have. Uh, I think the last thing that you, very latest thing that you had done was Harvard Business School, but that's not how your start was, because I know that. You pivoted quite a, quite a few things. Can you talk about your academic where, where you started and especially? Uh, I mean, right now I am I am a professor at at a local university, so students think that it's the end of their life because they failed a class, you know, and it was a part of their major or something like that, and life is over. Right? And and that's the other aspect of it from experience. Uh, I love sharing that. Like you don't you don't. I mean, nothing is set in stone. Nothing, you know. So I, I would like you to put some color to that. Yeah, absolutely. So my story, my journey on the educational side, I think is probably a little bit more common than I would think, but is is not necessarily what the popular press or the zeitgeist preach. And um, the spoiler alert is most of the time people tell you, follow your passion, follow you know uh, what you really want to do, right? And that wasn't my case. So what happened was, I originally went to University of Pennsylvania and I had, you know, obviously two Asian American parents and uh, the old cliche among Asian American parents is like, hey, I need my kid to go to an Ivy League, ideally Harvard. If they don't go to Harvard, maybe I'm a failure. But if they go to another Ivy League, then at least I'm not a complete failure. Right. So they're not abandoning you. They're exactly they're not disowning <laughs> you completely, right? But please get into Harvard at some point. So I got into the University of Pennsylvania, which is an Ivy school. And my parents said, hey, look, you know, we're super happy. Uh, you got into, you know, every Tiger parent's dream school now. Uh, and once you're, now you're in, you can study whatever you want, right? So I was uh, really good at math when I was growing up. And, and I always loved math. So I went in and, and I, I went into the College of Liberal Arts and I studied math. And I was having a good time my first semester of freshman year. And then I get this call uh, from my dad towards the end of my freshman year. And he basically said, hey, man, I, I got some bad news. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a riverboat gambler, as you know, uh, and uh, I've lost the business. We don't have any money. Yeah. We got nothing. Right. And yeah. so uh, you're on your own. And I know you're a smart kid. So you'll figure it out. Uh, but you might need to transfer out because, you know, this Ivy League school is super expensive uh, and we don't have any money. So after, you know, probably about an hour worth of panic and, and crying a little bit, because remember, I was pretty young back then. Mm -hmm. um, I, I rushed over to the uh, career office and I said, hey, guys, I, I need a job because I, I actually don't even have any money for like anything. Um, and they said, well, what, what are you studying? And I said, well, I'm studying math and liberal arts. And, and after they kind of laughed at me a little bit, they said, well, uh, you know, you could you could do like more study in the summer. You could be a uh, research assistant. And I said, does that pay? And you're like, no, it doesn't pay anything. I said, no, no, I, I need a job. Right. I need and to so, buy food. <laughs> yeah, I need to eat. Right. I need the pancakes. Remember the pancakes. Right. So, <laughs> so um, there, there was a this is very old school. Right. They had all these index cards up on the wall and under every one of the colleges and, and major areas of focus, you could see index cards. And under unfortunately, under the liberal arts school, there were like no call, uh, index cards. Right. Nobody was hiring English majors or math majors or physics majors. Right. But, but then I saw that there was uh, a lot of cars under the business school, the Wharton school. Right. I go, huh. What do those guys do? Oh, they study business and they get lots of good jobs. Right. And then, then there was another area for engineering and they got a lot of cards there. And then there was one area where there was just like literally unlimited uh, jobs. And it was people that did both uh, engineering and business. And it was a it was a at the time it was a still a relatively young program. And it was one of the first of its kind in the whole country where you could get a full engineering degree and, and a business degree. Uh, and it's called the management and technology program. And I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about engineering. Uh, but I but I told the guys, I said, hey, how do I get in that program? <laughs> because those guys seem to get all the jobs. And and the guy told me, the counselor told me, hey, look, well, they only let 50 kids in a year. And Penn at the time had like 2,000 kids a year. So we're talking wow. about a fraction. Um, and, and you got to have a perfect GPA. And it's really hard. And I said, I don't care. Like, I, I need to figure out how to get in that program because it looks like if you get in that program, you, you can get a job, no problemo. So, 
make a long story short, I actually switched into that program uh, after the end of my freshman year, and I graduated from that program. And, um, and you know, obviously, it, it helped me a lot to get that strong educational background, but but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. <laughs> if, if I was really honest, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to study math, and I wanted to uh, draw, I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to explore a lot of this creative side of me. But then the reality set in. The reality was like, I needed to figure out how do I you know, earn money to, to buy pancakes? How do I earn money to send money home uh, to my mom, who was largely abandoned by my dad at that point? So oh, wow. we were in a one bedroom apartment and uh, my mom was selling costume jewelry out of her secondhand Honda Civic. So reality set in. And what reality told me was, hey, you know, you, you're, you, you seem to be pretty good at taking tests. You seem to be uh, able to do well in these engineering and business areas. And that could open up a lot of doors for you. And so that set me on this path, which ultimately led me into a, a, a career uh, in Wall Street. And the last part of my education uh, came out where after a couple of years on Wall Street, um, I frankly needed a, a time out. I needed a break. Mm. And uh, nobody at Harvard Business School will ever tell you this, but Harvard Business School is like the best vacation you could ever imagine because you get to meet some of the greatest people in the world. You get to live and enjoy one of the most amazing campuses that will rival any Four Seasons, any hotel in Dubai. I, mm -hmm. I, I challenge you to look at a place that is more luxurious than Harvard Business School. Um, and you get the Harvard name on your resume. So in many ways, it's not there's really no cost, if you will, aside from you know stepping out of the workforce for a year uh, to two years. But I, I ultimately decided to go to Harvard Business School, one, to, to get a little bit of a time out from the, the grueling uh, work on Wall Street, but also to uh, kind of just, you know, figure out like what I want to do with the next stage of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I actually I, I have lectured. Uh, I was a, I, uh, several years at um, uh, at Harvard Business School, uh, you know, and it, that was a phenomenal experience. You're absolutely right about the buildings and and. Uh, the experience you get out of it, uh, it, it has been, uh, you know, it was phenomenal. I never went to Harvard Business School as a student, but I went there to the lecture. Uh, the, my topic was Amazon, actually, to Amazon or not to Amazon. I, I have the creative side of me is Shakespearean. So that's why the title of my speech is very Shakespearean. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, um, so, I mean, one lesson from that is like, you don't, I mean, what, actually, two comments I want to make. One, I think your mathematics background, which I also have extensive amount of mathematics in my background. I think the world, the language, the universal language, and it's going to sound cliche, but it's true. Whether it's marketing, it's business, it's finance, it's accounting, it's hedge funds, it's mathematics. It's mathematics. The, the common language, the universal language is, is that. If you can take whether it's a human emotion and you can turn it into numbers, right? You could study that and you could improve it. Anything you could measure, you could improve, right? So I think that transition that you made, and I, I did a similar transition, by the way, too. I, I have heavy mathematics, physics, and computer science background. I was on that side of the aisle, right? And I did graduate with a computer science degree. But over time, what happened was I realized that I'm, I, I understand the language of business. And I've been growing businesses for the past 25 years. And I grow them not by percentages, by multiples. That's what I do. Because it, thanks to my mathematics background, you know, that thanks to like not taking anything. And part of the engineering side of me says, don't take anything for granted. Everything is an assumption. You really need to test your assumption and don't get married to the idea. Because some people marry themselves too much to their idea, to their ego. And when it fails... They say, oh, that was my idea. Why did it fail? It should not have failed. Somebody else's fault. No, your experiment that was wrong. You know, you need to adjust your parameters. That's what you need to do. You know, so I think in your case, too, I think that mathematics background in your DNA, right, and the love for mathematics, I think in the long term, it's lurking back there. It's helping you a lot, I believe. I, I think you're right, uh, because I think the education provides a foundation for developing the muscle memory to learn. Uh, but I will say that in my experience, and I've, you know, I've now been working for more than 30 years. And 
in my career, I've spent most of it in technology and finance, but I've also worked with hundreds of different industries, entertainment, consumer products, et cetera. And what I found is that um, aside from going into hardcore research or science or really hardcore uh, areas, the, the things that you learn in school and the things that you develop um, are actually above and beyond what you actually need from a hardcore knowledge base to succeed in business. And I, I always used to joke that on Wall Street, where you know I, I reached the upper echelons of the industry, um, pretty much all of Wall Street still runs on math that you learn up to fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and, and there were a lot of my partners, uh, managing directors and whatnot, who were absolutely terrible at math, but they were pretty decent at mental math and were pretty good at multiplication and addition. Uh, they were they were never good at division because the Wall Street people are not good at sharing. Uh, but <laughs> I will tell you that the the math skills necessary on Wall Street are not that advanced. And so the thing that you learn to appreciate when you're in the business world is that um, once you have a minimum level of education, a minimum level of understanding of the basics like writing, reading, uh, doing math, right? Th there's a lot more of other stuff that you need to learn that actually gets you ahead in the corporate world that they don't teach you in school. And it's all the soft stuff, right? It's all the psychology stuff. It's all the interpersonal stuff. Um, and so I agree with you, the, the math part uh, as kind of like my foundation was really helpful, particularly when I first got into the business. Um, but Another dirty little secret around Wall Street is that when you're a junior person, what you really do on a daily basis is really two things. One is you become a Excel jockey and a PowerPoint god. That's the two things that you do. And that doesn't sound great from a recruiting standpoint. You know, they want to they want to tell you, oh, you're going to be exposed to masters of industry and you will learn, you know, the inner workings of uh, capitalism. And yes, you do learn all that kind of stuff more by osmosis. But the reality is on a daily basis, what you do as a junior person on Wall Street are the two things that I just mentioned. And if, if you if you subscribe to what I just said and you accept what I just said, the the skills needed to do that are not rocket science. Um, and you could probably master those in middle school. <laughs> you don't need an Ivy League education in order to master that. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of corporate America in particular, they, they try to uh, make the, the, the job uh, much more glamorous and much more exciting than it really is. And, and I will say the same thing in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of jobs that sound amazing when uh, when you look at it on their website, you know, you can be a senior product manager doing this or you could be, you know, uh, a core critical member of our project management team. Right. But if you really distill and you ask those people, like, what do you do on a daily basis? A lot of it still comes down to the same similar things. Oh, I track things on the spreadsheet. I add columns <laughs> up. Right. I, I put it if I put them in fancy charts <laughs> so people can understand it. And I write short memos so my boss can get the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. Well, I think there is there is difference between marketing and reality. Right. When, when you walk in, you, you see this this facade of whatever fantasy that you believe that company gives you. I don't want to name any companies, but that company gives you. Versus when you actually step in and now you're part of it, now you're married to it because you already put in the time to go through the interview process. You changed your jobs, maybe you changed your geography. You know, you were in New York and now you you moved to Austin, you know, Texas. So you made certain commitments on your side. Now you cannot backtrack, right? And now you get in, and then after a while, you are telling that same marketing story to the next group of people that are coming in, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Because <laughs> you you probably there's probably two things that happen. And, and I've seen this with uh, people that I've mentored in my career. Two two things typically happen once people start entering the workforce and they see how uh, the job and the work uh, evolves. One is that they realize, holy cow, like I was sold a bag of goods. 
this was not the job or career I thought it was. This was not uh, what I subscribed to. And some people stick around, but eventually it leads to demoralization. It leads to quitting. It leads to uh, unfulfillment, right? And, and I would say that the vast majority of Americans in particular are in that bucket. That's why there's time and time again, you see these surveys where anywhere from half to two thirds of Americans are not happy in their job. And I think it's because they're disillusioned. This is not what I thought it would be. Um, but then, but then there's the other third who I think realized, you know what? I can't believe I get paid to do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I can't believe that this thing is kind of a game. And so what I want to do is I want to figure out how do I level up as fast as I can so that I can make more money so I can get paid more to do this, whatever this is. Um, and so I think part of it is you either have to exit the game. And you have to say, look, this is this is not what I thought it would be. And rather than one day grow up and become, you know, some middle aged guy who's really depressed and, and realizes they waste their, their life on the wrong job, wrong, wrong career, you either have to exit the game or you have to figure out how to play the game. And so I always counsel people, no matter how old they are, to not get stuck in that rut, because, as you know, like time goes very quickly. And before you know it, and we have a lot of colleagues like this, before you know it, a decade goes by, two decades go by, and you're sitting around at a bar and you're having a drink and they and they tell you, you know, after a few drinks, they say, you know, I've never really been happy. <laughs> and, you, and you kind of feel sad for those people, right? You go like, yeah, it kind of sucks. Maybe you have to do it for uh, financial reasons, uh, you know, which frankly is a lot of us. But um, if you but have- it becomes, the- but they- doesn't it become like financial shekels if you think about it, right? Uh, that, you know, if you are into something for a year or two, you can give it up and say, okay, you know what? That's not for me. I'm going to move. I'm going to do this other thing completely. But I, I know I need to hit the reset button and start it. But now if you're in it for five years or seven years, what has happened in five to seven years of your career, right? Uh, your $60,000 job has now become $75,000 by, you know, seventy five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, Now you have committed to getting a home. Now you're getting married. Now you're dependent. Now it's not just you dependent on that salary. You have a family that's dependent on that salary. Now you cannot go and I want to hit the reset button because the other job might be maybe 65 or maybe even 50, you know, for me to hit that reset to go back. Now, okay, you know what? I'll think about it later. Later becomes even worse problem, right? In future. Because now you're in it for 10 years. What happened to that $75,000? Now it's like $95,000 for a job that you're doing that if you were to even change jobs in some cases, you're not going to get that $95,000 anywhere else. Now you're geographically stuck. You're financially stuck to that paycheck. And you cannot make that make that shift from, from that. You know, once you're, when, once you're, I think of it more like shackles, you know, when, when the cops put the handcuffs on you, you know. Yeah, it feels like that. That then, then for you to make that change, that's a drastic change. And financially, you may have already committed to uh, paying your mortgage to Citibank or Bank of America, right? Uh, your kids are, uh, you know, maybe they go to public school. Maybe you you invested in private school or private tutoring or something. All of those things depend on that paycheck that that you're getting from a job that you hate. I totally agree with you, and I I call it lifestyle creep. I call it, you know, where things just slowly creep up. And one day you get to a point where, you know, I got to live on a certain amount of money. And if I don't make that kind of money, I can't live the life I want. But I firmly believe that that is within your control. Um, a couple a couple stories and some data, right? So um, I'm a big fan of Danny Kahneman, the a godfather of behavioral economics and psychology. And uh, he he's done a bunch of research around what is the minimum amount of money people need to, to be happy. And the number, you know, ranges between 80 to 90,000 bucks a year. Okay. Now that's a lot of money, but I will tell you in almost all of the, uh, highly educated compensated industries in America, wall street, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, in most of these industries, that is the starting salary. Like that, that is like the people that we hire straight out of school with zero experience. Right. And so it's kind of ironic how there are so many people in these industries, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, who made that uh, initial amount that was necessary to be happy and, 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 and surpassed that the day they walked in the door. 
And yet when you talk to them, you say, hey, how do you like your job on Wall Street? How do you like your, your job in Silicon Valley? Many of them are not happy. So you have to kind of double click and figure out, okay, so why is that? Like, because you're already making, when you first walked in the door, you're already making what this Nobel Prize winning guy said is the minimum amount you need to be happy. So something doesn't add up. And I'll tell you, there, there, there's, there's two things. One I already mentioned, which is the lifestyle creep. But I actually think the second is much more insidious, which is keeping up with the Joneses. Right. It's all this about like, hey, you know, my friend who is just as well got a Tesla, <laughs> got a Tesla. Right. Uh, they 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 vacation in the Amalfi Coast in Italy. Uh, you know, they they their kids go to private school where they're learning Chinese. Right. And before you know it, that 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 adds up. And I'll tell you part of the reason why I'm a, a really cheap and I'm really frugal was when I was really young. I first started working in investment banking and I was really lucky that the head of the group took a real liking to me. Um, I think it was partly because I was really good at math. So the spreadsheet skills came back in, but also I was also someone that he could trust. Um, uh, I was someone that wasn't a blabber mouth and wouldn't like spread gossip around the office. So I was actually, as a, at a very young age, I was tasked with helping him develop the budget for our department. And as part of that, I would actually see all the compensation for all of the people in our department. So imagine this, like I'm, I'm effectively the janitor, right? And I see not only what I make, but my boss, what he makes, what his boss's boss makes and what his boss's wow. boss makes, right? So I could see what everybody else is making. And, you know, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you like the numbers just blew my mind, right? I graduated with $100,000 in debt and I saw that, you know, managing directors, um, on Wall Street would make that in like two weeks, right? <laughs> in their mm -hmm. conversation, right? Um, and so I, I remember this day uh, so distinctly because it, it just had such a huge, huge impression on me, which was that sometimes I would be in the room when the head of our group would hand out bonus checks to the various senior people um, because I was kind of the help, right? And one thing I know about the help is that sometimes you're invisible, like people don't even notice you're in the corner, right? So I was in the corner, you know, with the spreadsheets and the computer just to make any changes that the head of the department wanted on the fly. And I just sit there quietly while he would hand out bonus checks and give people their number. And most of the most of the discussions were pretty fine because, you know, it's kind of like take it or leave it, right? Here's your number. You're, you're getting 100 grand. You're getting 300 grand, whatever. Again, numbers that boggle my mind. Um, and then this, this big time managing director walks in and he was getting paid 500 grand a year in salary. And his bonus was 2 million bucks. And remember, I, I have a negative net worth at this point. And you know, <laughs> I think, I think my, my bonus that year was probably around like uh, $50,000 for the whole year, right? So it's a lot of money when you're 20 years old. Uh, but just to give you a sense, like I'm getting 50K and my this guy's getting two million. He's getting two million bucks, right? <laughs> and I, I've never seen I've never seen a check that has a million dollars and all those zeros, right? And so deep down, I didn't say anything. Deep down, I'm going, like, man, this is a lot of money. This guy's going to be ecstatic, right? Particularly given his productivity, and I see all the numbers. And the the, the my my the head of the department gave him his number, and this guy just like blew a gasket. <laughs> just like went ballistic. Like I'm talking about, you know, like if you've seen the movie, like Michael Douglas in Falling Down, like he just went nuts. Right. And I'm sitting there quietly going, oh, my God, like, should I leave the room? And Good movie like, reference, oh. by the way. I love that movie. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is I'm in the corner, so I can't actually leave the room. Right. So I'm just OK. I'll just nobody notices I'm here. So I'll just sit here and just listen. Right. And so he goes through this whole, like, you know, I can't believe this. You're screwing me. He's throwing out all these F words and whatnot. And, and he proceeds to basically, like, threaten to leave, right? And the head of the department, who clearly has heard this story multiple times, doesn't even flinch, doesn't do anything, right? Just silent, quiet, right? Then this managing director switches tactics, and he starts to give him a pity story because he knows that the tirade thing is not working. So... Mm -hmm. He starts to proceed and talk about how, like, hey, man, I can't live on this. I got I got ex-wife. I got alimony. The kids are in private school. I got a second home with a mortgage I got to pay for. I got the uh, he didn't have a Ferrari. I think he had a NSX, an accurate NSX, you know, and he starts going through it. Right. And and he starts to give us, you know, chapter and verse, like each what each thing sounds taught. like, you know, five stages of grief. That's what he's yeah. going through. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, the crazy thing is once he did that, 
I agreed with him. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this dude can't live on two and a half million dollars a year. Yeah. Not, not with all these expenses. Poor guy needs more. He needs more, right? Now, no, obviously poor, had, poor guy needs more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, you know, the head of the group didn't give him any more, but that that had such a huge impression on me. It was like, man, I don't ever want to be this chump. Like, I don't yeah. ever want to be in a position where if I'm making two and a half million dollars, I can't live. Because what I learned is that if you make two and a half million bucks, but you spend like you have three million bucks, you're broke. <laughs> You're in deep trouble. And so I go back to, you know, how we started this conversation. Um, it is shackles. It, it is. But but I do believe, and I know people may disagree with me, but I think a lot of that is self-imposed. And it's a lot of the pressures that we all feel to be part of the rat race, to keep up with the Joneses, to get that shiny car or that big fancy house. And one thing I know going all the way back, I never want to go back to this, but going all the way back to when, you know, I was in a one bedroom apartment with my mom and I had my younger brother there and we were selling costume jewelry out of a secondhand Honda Civic. And, you know, we, we didn't eat very well, but we ate every night. You know, most of the time it was probably mac and cheese or something like that. Like we were able to get by, right? We you were able to get okay. by on that. You were okay we were with okay. that. I mean, it wasn't yeah. great, right? But but we didn't we didn't end up homeless, right? I mean, so you it's amazing what I think you can live on if you downscale your lifestyle to a point where you don't care about what other people think. And the last thing I'll say on this is um that's frankly how I was able to walk away from my job in my early 40s. I, I walked away in my early 40s. I, ha I had the best year I ever had from a productivity standpoint. I was running a group. I was making a lot of money. But I was at a point in my life where I wanted to uh, be there for my family. I wanted to not be the cliche absentee dad. And I wanted to explore other things that I wanted to do, like entrepreneurship. And so I, I remember when I decided to, to make the transition, uh, I told my boss and I told several of my partners, and they were all shocked that, uh, one, that I, I was willing to do this uh, because most of the time it's like the mafia. Like you don't on Wall Street, you don't leave the mafia. The mafia leaves you. <laughs> so so when when I when I left, a lot of people were really surprised. And then second, a lot of people were really curious how I was able to do it. And I, I said, hey, it's really obvious. You know, uh, when you look at a lot of my partners, they're driving you know, seven series BMWs, they have a fleet of cars, they got the Ferrari, they got the sports car. Whereas at the time I was driving a, a Honda S2000, which is kind of like an Asian rice rocket car that, <laughs> you know, is in the twenties of thousands of dollars, not the $200,000, right? Uh, I, I still lived in the same house, the first house that my wife and I bought. Even to this day, we still live in the same house, right? So I think it is manageable, but but it's it's really hard. And, and unfortunately, I think a big part of it is that we feel this compelling need to always keep up with what we think society dictates of, of us from a prestige, from a, uh, you know, toys, from a economic standpoint. Yeah. I mean, just a few, few thoughts there. Um, one, I mean, if you just go through the exercise of a bigger home, right? If you get a bigger home because you want to keep up with the Joneses, the stuff that you have in the smaller home would not fit into the bigger home. And it's not when I say fit, I don't mean just the number of, you know, like sofa and uh, dining table and stuff like that. I mean, now you have five bedrooms. You need five different beds in there, even though you're going to use maybe one bedroom for yourself and one for your daughter. But you still need to furnish the other four, you know even though you're never going to use it ever, you know, <laughs> uh, that means that you have a bigger yard. The gardener that used to work for you in your smaller home, or you didn't even have a gardener, you did used to cut the grass yourself. Now you need to have a gardener because you have a half, a half an acre land or two acre land, you know, that, that needs, you know, you need to maintain it and stuff. So every decision you make like that, it's never a small decision. It has, it's a domino effect of decisions that you're making. So it's not like that rent is going to be or the mortgage is going to be, I don't know, $5,000 a month or $10,000 a month. There's other expenses that are connected to that lifestyle you just decided to choose to go with that. Buying a more expensive car, more expensive 
uh, more expensive insurance that you need to pay on top of that, right? Uh, so that those are the kind of things. Like one of one of the things that I would like to pivot the conversation a little bit. This is all great, you know. Uh, one one thing I gotta say, I think my I've said this in, uh, to my audience before. I, I grew up in Flushing, New York, and if you know anything about Flushing, New York, is uh, since the night late '90s, it has become predominantly an Asian community, right? All my neighbors are Asian. When I say Asia, I mean China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, you know, Philippines. It's it's a when they say melting pot, it's a melting pot, but majority of the population is. Uh, from China and from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Those are the three areas, but there are other types of Asians here too. And one of the things that I can say, and Flushing is thriving uh, because of this change that we had in population. The ownership, home, you know, like home ownership, business ownership, uh, employment, other commercial properties, other types of businesses and stuff like that is incredible, is incredible in the Asian community, right? When, whenever, uh, you know, and, and this area now predominantly, English is the secondary language in this area. I'm in New York. I'm not in some foreign country, you know. But when you walk around Flushing, the signs are not in English, you know. Uh, you, you're expected to know the other language. And then, you you know, just like in Miami, you know, the primary, primary language is Spanish there, you know. English is secondary language there, you know. So similar to that, in, in Flushing, New York, it's it's like the different dialects of Chinese and then uh, some other versions of it. Uh, I do want to talk about the the sense of entrepreneurship uh, in the in the Asian community, uh, and you know you, your life and and the story that you told us about your background and what's important and stuff. Those are definitely kind of the foundational. You know, and, and you, you know, you made a funny comment about the par Asian parents, and and uh, by the way, my parents were very similar in that sense too. Uh, you know, my my parents are Central Asian. You know, I was born Turkish, but my my and the same A through F letter grades in in school means very similar things. By the way, between a Chinese family or Asian family and my family, you know, F means find another family. That's what F means on your grade. You know. I, you you understand what I'm talking about? Oh, totally, the, the totally period. get it. Yeah, yeah no, but totally. but that sense of entrepreneurship and especially being an Amer American immigrant, right? An immigrant in America, and then the opportunities that you get. We were talking a little bit about that in in the green room. The that sense of freedom for you to do anything you want to do in this country, as long as it's legal, right? The country affords you those kind of opportunities for you to decide what you want to do. In some countries, you're not. You cannot. You know, in some countries, they put you in a technical school and say, OK, you're a carpenter now. That's it. That's what you will be for the rest of your life. You know, but here you you could start as a carpenter and decide to become a billionaire selling eggs. You know, it's up to you, you know, whatever you want to do. So specifically around uh, Asian entrepreneurship, um, what what is your sense of like because. Uh, Every every community where Asians descend on and they buy property, they establish businesses, whether it's it could be as simple as a nail salon to all the way to like having factories and having whole businesses, you know, and, and, and those communities thrive. That's a fact, by the way, across the United States. What sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, facilities are available for young uh, Asian entrepreneurs that come in or immigrant uh, 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 Asian entrepreneurs that come in or, or they want to start up their business. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so I think that it's it's difficult. It's challenging because the reality is that uh, Asian Americans in particular are, if you if you look at it, it's a, it's not a monolithic group, even though they're classified that way, right? Like uh, East Asians are very different from Southeast Asians. From an ethnic, from a upbringing standpoint, and even when, even within the East Asian community, you know, Koreans, Chinese, Japanese are very different. Uh, but we all kind of get lumped together, and even when you lump us all together, we're still only the uh, fourth largest ethnic group in America. You know, uh, below Caucasians and below uh, Latinos and, and African Americans. Um, and so what I've seen in, in my career and even to this day is that there's a lot less priority given to uh, Asian Americans from a uh, support standpoint. Um, the, the spoiler alert is that the, the, where, where you do see some uh, help is given by other Asians, 
by other people that have made it, that have maybe developed uh, funds and are looking to invest back into the community. And I'll give you one very tangible example. Uh, I've been very close to an organization called Gold House. And Gold House was really started as a way to uh, bring together more Asian Americans in the media and entertainment arena. And the founder there, Bing Chen, um, he's a close friend of mine. He's a really great guy. He uh, he calls me uncle uh, uh, to a point where actually people think we're related. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he's a thousand times a better looking than me. So there's no way we're related. But um, Gold House is an example of how you can use the Asian American community to help the Asian American entrepreneurial community. And the way we've done that is that uh, Gold House has expanded way beyond what it originally was intended for and created a venture capital group uh, called Gold House Ventures, of which I'm involved as an investor. And we specifically look for um, Asian entrepreneurs, uh, Asian American entrepreneurs uh, in the founding team, and we uh, help them. Uh, by investing and also help them by, um, you know, putting them into accelerated programs, uh, helping them network with Silicon Valley VCs, the vast majority of whom are white guys. Um, mm. And so that's just a very small example of how the community is trying to help itself because nobody else will, because we're the fourth um, largest community. And Sabir, one of the other things that's really challenging is that uh, Asian Americans suffer from uh, a very well documented uh, uh, stereotype, which is the the model minority myth. And um, you know this has been around uh, for uh, you know three, four decades now. So it, it's not like this happened overnight. And it's essentially the stereotype that non Asians have of Asians, which is that you guys all work really hard. You're all super good at math. You all over. <laughs> Um, and therefore, you don't need any help, right? Like you don't need any help. And unfortunately, this myth has a very insidious beginnings. This myth was actually created as a way for the majority to say that uh, minorities don't need any help in America. Like because look at the good Asians; <laughs> they don't need any help. They don't get any help. And look, they're 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 all like rock stars, right? And and that is just so far from the reality. Uh, there's a lot of Asians, just like regular Americans in poverty. Uh, there's a lot of Asian Americans that frankly aren't good at math, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, and when you look at some of the more recent research uh, done by Harvard, of all places, um, Asian Americans are actually the least likely to get promoted in America. And the, the reason is because Asians actually do really well at the junior level. So a lot of these industries that are highly compensated that we talk about, like technology, Wall Street, um, some of these uh, law, medicine, right? These industries, the the model minority myth and the elements of Asian Americanness are actually really good to get you in the door, but they're the mm -hmm. same things that actually hurt you as you move up the corporate ladder. It's the same things that make you appear to be much more of a follower and not lead a leader. And so I think that's also part of the reason why you see so much entrepreneurial spirit among Asian Americans, because for a lot of them, and this is an unfortunate case, a lot of them get to some point in their career and they realize, you know what, I'm never going to get promoted to this place. I'm never going to have the top job. And so rather than try to figure out how to crack the code and play the rat race, I'm going to exit this game and I'm going to go start my own company. I'm going to go start my tech company or my food business or what have you. And so that's why I think you see so much interest, uh, not only historically, but even to this day, so much interest in entrepreneurship around uh, the Asian American community. Uh, one other example is I'm involved with a, a site, uh, which is really a community called Asian uh, Hustle Network, AHN. And we are one of the fastest growing communities uh, on Facebook, on, on the internet. And uh, I think the, the numbers are now like quarter of a million highly engaged uh, members. And it's all these Asian Americans who are looking for the hustle. They're looking for how do I start my own business and be my own boss? Because I don't want to work for these white guys anymore to be very crude. <laughs> right. Um, and so th that's another way that I think you see the community help itself, which is uh, the Asian Hustle Network. 
it's not so much capital, but it's more education. It's uh, throwing conferences where we try to educate other Asian Americans on what it's like to start a real estate brokerage business, what it's like to start a franchising business, what are some of the things that you need to be worried about when you're hiring people, right? So there, there's, if you look, there's actually quite a lot of resources, but, but if you look at the commonality, they're almost mm -hmm. always started and run by other Asian Americans who see a deficiency in the market and realize that the only people that are going to help this community are ourselves. Because again, there's a lot of stereotypes and a lot of bias around the fact that the community is overachieving and there's no need to actually provide them help. There's no need to reach down and, and give them a, a leg up, uh, unlike maybe some of the other minorities in America. Yeah. I mean, living in Flushing, I can tell you that I come across Asian of all different types, right? People who are like extremely poor, like I'm talking about when, when I'm talking about extremely poor, uh, on Sunday nights, they're walking around with their bags to collect uh, soda cans so that they can take it to the recycling in order to make a couple of nickels. You know, I'm talking about dead levels. So the thing is, if you are not exposed to it, you you don't know. Like that's that's reality of uh, also reality of flushing. And then you have the other reality of flushing on the other side of the spectrum and everything in the middle, by the way, too. The other side of it, uh, Asian builders buying up amazing properties and, and high rises in Flushing, right? And and and, the, and they're making the community thrive and and all with all this business and uh, you know property and the value of properties and stuff like that going up. So I, I've seen that whole spectrum of it living living in Flushing. I don't know if the the same is true about the Bay Area that you see that kind of a spectrum. If you don't see it, then you're then you're believing whatever media is telling you about. Oh. Uh, Asians are the the richest uh, communities in the world, you know, or, or in the United States, right? So, boom, there's no need for a, any kind of funds, startup funds, or SBA loans, or anything like that to to help that group, you know. Yeah, and there there really aren't like the the supports come from within. It comes from within the community, and it's not something where you see mainstream America providing those kind of resources. At least I haven't seen it. So when where does where do you think uh, the issue lies? Uh, let me uh, let me qualify that statement. So immigrant parents come from China or Philippines or Uzbekistan. That's what where my ancestors are from. You know, they come here. They're entrepreneurs to start with. A lot of them are. You know, they're entrepreneurs, meaning that they were doing some kind of trade. It doesn't mean that they're rich entrepreneurs. They just had a shop selling something. You know, grocery store maybe even. They come here, they, they, what they do is they put their kids through whether public school, most of them do, you know, some of them might, if they have a little bit more money, maybe it's private school. When the kids are uh, growing up and they're forced to learn so much with education that uh, you have to get an A. If you're not an A, we're disowning you, right? You're not ours. I mean, that mentality, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. You're smiling. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, totally. I get it. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, then what you said earlier, uh, you have to make it to Princeton. You have to make it to Yale. You have to make it to Harvard, right? And there's a strong push for that, right? And yet, as a parent, you're the grocery store owner. You're doing really well for your family. You're providing, but your kids, you're expecting them to get out of that. What happens? That kid goes to a law school, does, does their thing. 10 years from now, they go like, you know what? Life is not fair. I don't like this. I don't care about the $2 million. I need to get my life back, right? And then they go to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Even though that was in their DNA, they had something incredible with them. It's like, you know, even parents forcing their kids to learn another language, like English. They have to learn English. Don't speak any hey, at home. Don't speak Tagalog or Filipino. Don't no Turkish at home, right? You have to speak English, but why? You, you, your kid is multilingual. They're bilingual. Why are you taking that away from them? I think even the language of entrepreneurship that's in your DNA in your home, and you could be talking about your business. That kid, you're pushing them off to Ivy League, and you're taking away the 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 entrepreneurship sense that they are going to at one point they're going to need that in 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 future tense. What do you think about that statement? I, th I think that's really accurate and actually pretty astute. Um, 
I think one of the challenges is that many of the early immigrants that first come to this country, I think they 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 go into entrepreneurship uh, more out of lack of opportunity than anything else. You you come to this country and you know you, you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, you you don't even wear the kind of clothes that they wear at various uh, corporate events. But what you do know is you know the business of buying and selling. I buy low, I sell high, <laughs> right? Uh, you know the business of import export, right? And you open a laundromat, you open a foodstuff store, right? And, and you get by, you figure out a way to provide for your family. But I think as you uh, progress and you, know, you have your kids study at some great universities and they talk to people like you and I, and they listen to podcasts like this, what they realize is that um, entrepreneurship is really the, uh, you know, for lack of a better description, it's kind of like ultimately all of our destiny, right? We, we all want to control our lives. We all want to be entrepreneur of our lives, which means that we also want to be entrepreneurs. Some of us have the uh, privilege and opportunity to do that. A lot of us don't because we may not have the right connections. We may not have the access to capital. We may not think that we have the appetite for risk. Um, but if you subscribe to the idea that entrepreneurship is inherent in all of us, then what, what I always tell people to think about is the real key to entrepreneurship is leverage. It's figuring out how do you use your precious resource, which is time, to maximize the potential outcome for you if you are successful. And I think that as you start to uh, have that marinate in your brain, you realize that running a food store, which my dad ran, um, that generates you know less than 1% margin on every piece of product that we sell, that requires me to break my back to move pallets from X to Y, may not actually be the best use of my time, may not actually give me the most leverage. But what does give me a lot of leverage is if I can build a business that's digital, so I'm not in the Adams business, I'm in the digital business, that I can create a product that if I can get that one product to work, I can essentially distribute it to everyone on the planet over the internet, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, start to, you start to realize that if I wanna be an entrepreneur, which is what my dad was, what my mom was, and, and it's probably deep inside me, even though for some time I was a lawyer at some crappy law firm and I was somebody working stiff, if, if you subscribe to that entrepreneurship ultimately is deep inside me, then what I should do is I should think about how to unleash that, but but create the maximum amount of leverage on my time. And so that's why I think you see, and, and we see this, I see this all the time in, uh, you know, in entrepreneurs that I work with, that I invest in, is that their family actually may have come from an entrepreneurial lineage, right? Um but then they went to Princeton, they got the law degree, they went to investment banking, right? And then they realized, you know what? I don't want to work for anybody. It, entrepreneurship is still in my DNA, but I'm going to do something that has a lot more leverage than what my parents did. And most of the time, that is uh, higher value, more uh, cutting edge companies that are in the internet space, they're in the software as a service space that are in biotech or healthcare. Because again, when you go back to this notion of leverage on your time, um, these are situations where if you get it right, if you find product market fit, if you find people that are willing to pay for it, right, the the outcome, the economic uh, outcome to you is is magnified, <laughs> like substantially, mm -hmm. particularly if you're you're a student of, of uh, financial leverage, too. Right. You use other people's money. You, you you raise a lot of venture capital, but you don't dilute yourself that much. So that's why I think you see this progression. And I think it'll only get better. The, the only the only um, arbiter against this is I do think that if you're a person of color, it's challenging. Um, and I think it's very challenging, particularly if you're like African-American or Latino American, because um, in many ways, the the biases that we now have talked about for Asian-Americans, the same biases exist uh, for African-American and Latino communities, but they're they're rarely positive, uh, particularly they're negative. Yeah, the world. they're all negative. Right. So if you're if you're a young African-American entrepreneur, you, you got to try twice as hard, 10 times harder than a Caucasian to raise the same amount of capital. You you probably need to try, you know, just as hard to recruit like great talent. 
Um, and so I think it, it it behooves us all to figure out how do you level the playing field somewhat so that, you know, that, that next uh, Elon Musk, who happens to be African-American, um, ends up not realizing his dreams because of, uh, because of the color of his skin. Uh, and that's really the only reason. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, in that group also, I think it's mostly the minorities, you know, it's mostly the minorities, including women, right? That uh, there was a study, I think, uh, uh, venture capital, how much, in, you know, funding they did, do, do they do to women founders or co-founders? And it was a very small percentage. And the rejection was incredibly high rate. If you remember that study, I think it was several years ago. That, oh, yeah. That study Even to this day, it's, it's less than 5%. And yeah. It's uh, in many ways, it's part of our evolutionary biology, right? Like the, the people in power, when they take on uh, risky projects or risky uh, uh, adventures, um, one of the ways that they mitigate risk is by uh, bringing into the tribe uh, people that they can relate to, people of the same gender, people of the same skin color. And yeah. there is really nothing more risky in the corporate world than venture capital. Right. Because you essentially most of the time you're investing in something that's very early, that may not have product market fit, um, that if you if you subscribe to, uh, you know, kind of traditional ideas among the venture capital community, um, you, you have to uh, invest in things that are viewed by the majority as insane. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Because, because otherwise someone else would have done it. Right. So think about that for a minute. I'm going to write checks for insane projects. So my evolutionary biology is probably telling me, go invest in people that kind of look like you, that you can relate to, right? And the only way we're ever going to break that is if the people that are writing checks are more women. The people that are writing checks are more minorities. Um, and that's why you see going full circle. That's why you see things like Gold House Ventures, where, you know, we're, we're investing in people that are younger versions of me, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I go, yeah, I, I can see this kid, you know, uh, uh, blossoming and becoming an entrepreneur because that's what happened to me. Yep. So, I mean, uh, what an incredible conversation. I, I really loved, I mean, especially the, the, the rich history. Uh, when I say rich, I don't mean wealth. I mean, rich history uh, of your upbringing and academia and background, and especially uh, the discussion we had uh, related to the Asian American entrepreneurship. I ask every guest of mine, what, what is their number one in your case, because you, you have closed $15 billion, I would say, what is your $1 billion expert insight into uh, Asian American entrepreneurship? I, I think that the, uh, the one piece of advice that I always give, particularly Asian Americans, which uh, is, is, is tough because it goes contrary to the way they were raised. And this piece of advice applies whether you're scaling corporate America or you are an entrepreneur founding a company and trying to make it successful, is that we all get raised to, uh, frankly, be good at everything. And this goes back to your uh, joking around about the grades, right? Uh, we, we've all, we all know the cliche, and this is more of a, this is even a more of an immigrant story, but it's, it's so common and so cliche among Asians uh, that every Asian will nod their head. And I'm sure your parents and your family would too, but like you come home, you got all A's, but you got that one B, right? And your parents go like, you know, why the hell did you get that B, right? And do, and do you so, know that they give out A's? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, so from a very young age, we're indoctrinated with this idea that um, we need to be good at everything, right? Otherwise, don't come home. Mm -hmm. And when you're a junior person entering corporate America or when you're starting your first company, you still have that. Whether, whether you admit it or not, you, you've been indoctrinated in that idea. And the problem is that um, time is a zero sum game. Right. I'm, I'm bringing a lot of themes back here together. Um, and when you try to be good at everything, you don't end up being great at any one thing. OK. And what I have found is that when you uh, rise the corporate ladder, uh, it's a pyramid. When you're raising money, right, there's only so many projects that a venture capital or investor can invest in. They can't invest in everything. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're when you're competing at the highest level, it is a pyramid. And 
uh, either your boss needs to choose you or your uh, colleague to promote, or some VC needs to choose whether to invest in your idea or someone else's, right? And what I find is that the the com competition, the, uh, the 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 guy that's fighting for your your uh, manager job, or that person that's trying to raise money from that VC, what they realize is that the and and this goes for both corporate America and for investing. What they realize is that if you have that one thing that you're great at, not good at, but you're great at, people will give you the benefit of the doubt on other things. They will accept like, you know, Dave uh, has this startup idea and he's he's like the best in the world at genomics. I'm just pulling something out of the air, right? Mm -hmm. But but he kind of sucks socially. Uh, I don't think he can really manage people, but you know what? He's the world's best at genomics. And so we'll hire people around him that are better on the people side, right? And so mm -hmm. that guy that's great at that one thing investors are looking for, or is great at that one thing the managers are looking for, right? Like in investment banking, for instance, um, just to give you a concrete example, right? When you, when you have the corporate ladder in investment banking on Wall Street, sales is the number one superpower people are looking for, right? It's no longer, hey, is this guy really good at mental math? Is this guy really good at like fixing typos? Is this guy a, a great team player, honestly? No. It's that this guy can sell ice to Eskimos, right? And so in both of those scenarios, if your competition realizes what is that thing, that one thing you need to be great at, not good, they will beat you every time. And so I tell Asian Americans, and this is, this is a really bitter pill to swallow, right? It's that you can't be good at everything. You got to be great at the one thing that customers want, that investors want, that your boss wants. And you got to give up on other stuff. You got to sacrifice other stuff because other stuff won't matter at the end of the day. And this is frankly why, you know, you see so many frustrated entrepreneurs who don't get funding, or you see a lot of frustrated people that are rising corporate ladder where they, they look at their resume, they look at their, 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 uh, you know, their business plan, they look at whatever and they go like, you know, we, we kind of check off all the boxes, right? Like, you know, we, why, we why am I not getting funded? <laughs> why am I not getting funded? Well, you know why? Because you're not really great, right? Mm -hmm. You're, 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 you're fine, but you're not really great. And that other guy that you think that guy's an ass or, you know, they, they don't have, uh, you know, the, the, all the check boxes you have, but then the one area that the investor is looking for or that manager is looking for, they are great versus you. That's the reason why they want. And so that's where I always tell Asian Americans to think about this indoctrination that we all have when we were really small and we were told you got to be good at everything. You got to let go of that. Math, because science, I, violin, <laughs> everything. You can, yeah, you can't. You you, you got you got to double down on the one or two things that you think society will really really value, and um and a lot of people have a hard time. But but that advice has never steered me or the people that I've mentored wrong. Particularly as you go up and the stakes get higher and higher. I mean, that's definitely a one billion dollar advice. I I really appreciate you, Dave, uh, being on the show and sh sharing your journey and and your wisdom with us and especially with with all those helpful uh sites that you mentioned uh of like the asian hustle uh you said asian that, hustle network asia hustle hustle network definitely uh what what i'll do is dave uh, you you can give me all the links and i'll make sure to include them uh in the show notes as well as in the article so that anyone that comes across this episode they can find that uh very helpful well thank you for being on the show dave Thanks so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure today sharing what I know with you and your audience. Thank you. And thank you for to the audience that tuned in live or, or catching this on a recording. Uh, we have a lot of great guests like Dave coming up uh, for the rest of the year. So definitely tune in on a weekly basis on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. All right. Thank you.